So here we are with another talk show, and this time we've got a familiar face, or a familiar voice. It is Robin from Moritz Grotzman. Are you Great to see you again. Yeah, fine. See, you can tell he's polite, he shook your hand. He did, this one was polite. <laughs> not like those Swiss guys that were here last time. So, no, and to be fair, yeah. one of them was Canadian, and even he turned out not to be that polite. He'll apologise for it later on. He will, yeah. He will. So why are you here? Um, I'm here because you asked me to show you more about some Moritz Grotzman watches, which I'm utterly delighted to do. Yeah. We did a podcast, I think it was November. It time, was. And we didn't get much footage, we didn't get much in the way of photos. So I said to you, if you're kicking around, you're not doing anything. And since you're a, an unemployed bum, you said any time. <laughs> you thought you'd come up to Scotland and show off the pieces that we actually spoke about Unem on the unemployed podcast. Unemployed ex-spy, if you please. That's true. Until yes. he gets called up again. Yeah. Unemployed ex-spy. Yeah. Spy number one. So, Moritz Grotzman, for yep. the people that haven't seen one of these shows before, haven't seen the podcast, well, haven't heard the podcast. The voice that you're hearing Yay. in the background is Rick. Woo. And he has a spy, so that's the reason he doesn't appear on film in anything. Somebody else needs to check that all the red lights are flashing in this camera gear while we're doing it. <laughs> I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I think it's okay. So we're all good. So, Moritz Grotzman, for yep. the viewers that don't know anything about the brand at all, do you want to introduce it? Um, it is... The quickest way of introducing it is to say it is Germany's most exclusive independent watch brand. Uh, okay. Based in Glassiter, handmade, about 400 pieces per annum, uh, and made in a way which does the best that we can possibly do to honor the legacy of the guy that we're named for, which is uh, Moritz Grossman, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was one of the real founding fathers of the German watch industry in Glassiter way long ago. Right. Okay, we're done. We can go home now. Thanks sorry. very much. That's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Right, it okay. was short, it was sweet. That was, that was short and sweet. Uh, so give us a bit more background then. How long has the brand been going? What sort of markets do you cater to? What sort of range do you have? Okay, so um, we've been going 11 years on the button. Uh, so Christine Hutter, who's our chief executive, has been in the watch business uh, since she was a kid, she didn't go to university, trained watchmaker, had worked in some of the different um, brands in Glassiter, including Langer, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some stage in her journey through watches, decided that when she had the guts to have her own business, uh, she was going to base it in Glassiter. And right. she had discovered Moritz Grossman's story in a magazine somewhere, because Moritz Grossman's story is a great one, but had died with him. Um, back at the end of the 19th century. So, mm -hmm. so commercially, he was dead for more than a century. Uh, Christine got the rights to use his name, uh, actually opened the business in 2008, uh, started with designing the first Bennu. That was about a year and a half in the gestation. So we've been actually selling watches for not quite 10 years now. Right, okay. So let me get this straight. The chief executive's surname is Huta. Yep. And you're from Glasshuta. Correct. Is this is like Arsene Wenger managing Arsenal. <laughs> I, I, I had never seen it as that, but it's almost certainly <laughs> the, the same people have been involved in those different positioning things. I was yeah. thinking they could have named the company Hooters Watch Company. But, uh, they but, could well have done, and then yeah. this podcast video would not be happening. No, yeah. And, or maybe and Moritz, although the green lighting and yeah. the other lighting that's available in this room yeah. would probably have been appropriate. Yeah. And, and Moritz Grossman's soul would not have been brought back to the world, which would have been a pity. It would have been. So yeah. what was his connection back to the history of... Uh, uh, so so I'll, I'll try and do this as quickly as I can. Uh, Glassiter was a mining town. Mm -hmm. The mines ran out. And the people basically were destitute. They were doing some basket weaving was what they oh, managed, Raven's to, Creek. managed to find. I was going to say, yeah. it's not... In Auchinleck, when they closed the mines, they didn't decide to start making watches. What's yeah. going on? So, so they didn't decide. Yeah, it okay. was uh, uh, Langer's antecedent, Ferdinand Adolf Langer, in, I'm going to say about 1840, uh, was lobbying the Saxon court hard for money to go to mm -hmm. Glasseter to, to, to start a watch industry there. And, you know, I'll, I'll surmise why. It was partly as a way of differentiating himself because he lived in Dresden. There was a bit of an industry going on in Dresden. And also, crucially, I learned from the tall watchmaker. Um, he needed access to power. And he didn't have a license to use the power in the river in Dresden. And there's a little stream running through glass that he could use. Eventually, um, Saxon Court gives him the money. He goes up there and he persuaded some people to go with him. 
uh, of which three were absolutely crucial. A guy called Julius Arsman, a guy called Adolf Schneider, who there is no picture of, of any description. No one has a clue what he looked like. Just like me. Uh, just like you. Uh, in fact, no, you might Arsman. be him. You might be him. And, uh, and, and our guy, Moritz Grossman. Moritz Grossman, uh, I, I will say, we were chatting about this with Sandra, who I'm indicating, who's, a, again, a spy behind the camera, um, was the absolute glue that held the thing together. And I'm going to say, without Moritz Grossman, there wouldn't be a modern glass hitter, which is a bit of a bold thing to say, mm -hmm. until you go, not only was he an amazing horologist, inventor, teacher, uh, linguist, all of those things. His big thing was to raise the quality of, of watchmaking worldwide and make it as mechanically simple and beautiful as it could possibly be engineered, all of that stuff. Right. But he also knew that a town needed a, a soul, so he ran the social club, he had the he ran the choir. He went, oh, we're now working with flammable materials, perhaps we need a fire brigade. As it got to wow. grow, he went, oh, we're going to need a, um, a railway. So he built the, he organized for the railway to be built up from Dresden up to Glasshitter. And the absolutely crucial thing was he started the German School of Watchmaking in 1878, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sandra's nodding. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and um, did such an amazing job of that that the, um, the museum in Glasshitter, which is well worth a visit, is now housed in the building. If you go into that building, there's one huge room, which is, this is what an apprenticeship in 1878 would have been like. And year one, make screws, mm -hmm. you know, by candlelight or by daylight with no electric power. Where, and, and you look at the size of these things and you go, so a year doing that, and after a year, then you've proved you can work enough with metal. And mm -hmm. then you start, you know, graduating onto, let's do something more complicated. And so in that room, there's a, a picture of, of uh, there's his portrait in the corner and all around the room, I don't know how many names there are, but thousands of names of luminaries from the watch industry who'd gone through that uh, and built a, an industry which was that strong that they went from making baskets mm -hmm. to being commissioned by Kaiser Wilhelm to make pieces for visiting heads of state in about a generation and a half, which is, I think, an amazing story of sort of yeah. social renovation. And, and, you know, our guy played a... a, a absolutely pivotal role in that and I take my hat off to it. So what's your background then? Because you seem to have a clue. Um, <laughs> Which is a change in the podcast it is. last well, night. Well, no, you've actually been yeah, really so, so, um, Have you been on Wikipedia before you came over? Uh, <laughs> no, but I've been to Glasshitter a couple of times and I've, <laughs> and I've picked up some of the story because it's, and honestly, it's very easy to pick up because it's so, it's so emotionally compelling for me yeah. anyway. It's like my background was in organization development and helping people succeed and and so a story about bringing a town up from nothing to, to its mm -hmm. current position surviving two world wars a whole spell behind the iron curtain still going strong i think is a, is a cool story but um truthfully three years ago i didn't know a watch from a hole in the ground and uh you asked me where it all started and it all started 30 years ago with that which is a quartz abel which i bought with a little portion of my first ever bonus check somewhere about I don't know, 1995 for about mm -hmm. 1,500 quid in Miami duty free, and that stayed on my watch, <clears throat> that stayed on my wrist completely um, for everything. I went diving in it at the works for about 25 years, and I thought that was me and watches sorted. Then it turned out that in a drawer, um, which I'd completely forgotten, I had my dad's old um, Navy issue World War II. Omega. Um, he was captain of a landing craft at D-Day. So this watch was at D-Day. Uh, I didn't know what I had. It had once upon a time. It had the original strap, which was absolutely minging, uh -huh. which I took off and threw away, knowing no better. Um, but uh, that's now time on her hands gave me a strap so that it could get back on my wrist. Um, the few so what times is this I, one? Uh, so so it is. It's it's an Omega that was issued to my dad, who was captain of a landing craft by the Navy, it was issued to him by the Navy in the Second World War. So that'll be radium? Uh, it is indeed radium, so we need to have our lead suits on. here you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is. And is, and, it, and is it Royal Navy marked on the back? Uh, it, it's got something on yeah, it. Yeah, it's got something, I, it's, I haven't. It's got the wee pointy arrow it's thing. It's got the yeah. broad arrow, so yeah. it's official. I don't know if that's oh. going to be one of the Dirty Dozen then, is it? That Dirty Dozen watch? I shall inspect it from mm. behind the camera shot. Do so. And you can yeah. explain to me what a dirty dozen watches so later. I'm now displaying how little I know. The British military, I think it was, it was the second world war, wasn't it? Or was it the first? Well, it must have been the second. 
I'm confused. First World War was 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 slim pickings for wristwatches. Yes, that, 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 that was when they were kind of invented in the, in so the, that people could the tell the time World without. War, the British military uh, issued a requirement for the provision of watches for servicemen. Yeah. Of which there were twelve companies that submitted, and it was all a standard spec. Yeah. And twelve companies submitted them, and only a few of them survived today. Yeah. In that, uh, some companies only made five hundred. Yeah. Others made hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Uh, and so there's actually an article on the there's an article on the Scottish Watches website. Oh, I think. Did you write that? I edited it. I did not write it. You put the mistakes I, in. I put the mistakes, <laughs> I put the mistakes <laughs> to in. somebody else's work. I put Perfect. the mistakes in and stole the pictures from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You TGV'd yeah. it. Okay. So I TGV'd it. Come and, come and grab this. Um, and, carefully. Uh, and let Rick have a look at it so he can have a poke around at it whilst, whilst we're talking. We'll not do that again. Okay. <laughs> no, that's cool. Um, well, we provoke. We should probably do an actual wrist check. So yeah. what have you got on the wrist today? So today, in addition to my little um, band thingy, which oh, is which I've which I've replaced my buddies. I've replaced my beard. I've decided if I, my beard was going to be there had to be another way of looking like an idiot. So mm -hmm. I got one of these the other day. Um, so in addition to that, I've got a platinum Bennu, which was the sort of official loan watch that I was given when I started agenting right. for. Morris Grossman. I couldn't quite believe I had a £40,000 watch on my wrist when I walked out the door. Uh, and the more I looked at its little red detailing and needle sharp hands, the more I thought this is a really cool watch. Okay. So that's what I've got. And what's the white? It, this is platinum. platinum. Um, so if I lob this your way, okay. you can feel the heft of it and you can go, oh yeah, that is platinum. Fantastic. And you know, the uh, butterfly buckle and the immaculate finishing on the back, which is the hallmark of anything Moritz Grossman. And that is a big balance wheel. It is a big balance wheel. So, um, nice a lot of decorated cock, isn't it? It is um, a decorated cock, cantilevered to boot, mm. uh, in order to accommodate the enormous balance wheel. We do stop at the pair of you. Uh, what do you mean, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, why is it a big balance wheel? It's a big balance wheel because that's a nod to pocket watches. And if yeah. you listen to the tick speed, you'll hear that's satisfyingly slow. Uh, and, what, is it 18? Uh, it is 18. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, a German engineer would tell you that because it's bigger, it experiences infinitesimally less air resistance and therefore is in infinitesimally more accurate. Oh, really? Which was what Grossman was about. Wow. That's uh, not sure that I would notice, but that's what an engineer tells yeah. me. Well, for anyone that cares, probably one person I'm wearing at the Boulevard Accutron, 1967. This is the first commercial electronic watch, not quartz, as some people think, but runs with a tuning fork. So it's not probably quite as old as your dad's little yeah. guy there on the table, but yeah. Yeah, sold off. I can confirm that I am now wearing the Omega uh, Dirty Dozen watch and my Panerai's going in the bucket. Yeah, this is, now I'm not an expert at judging condition, uh, but I would say this is like, uh, it's not mint, because obviously some of the stuff has faded, but this is an absolutely epic condition for as an Omega Dirty Dozen watch, I believe. I might be proved to be entirely wrong, but this is something quite, quite special. You've got. I'm going to oh, I feel like I'm on the I, antiques roadshow. I was show. going to say I'm going to do my antiques roadshow thing. <laughs> yes, if I was to value this today, mm -hmm. Bob, it would be. Yeah, that is quite. That's quite something. Very impressed with that. Lovely. Good. Um, I what to do is like keep keep holding on to it very tightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Yeah. No, that's nice. And what else have we got on the table here? Because you uh, brought so, some of your own collection yeah. and you've brought some of the And I've brought some pieces that, that you particularly well. want. So, so the four here are my own collection. Right. And and quickly I will take you through why it was I chose those in order. Okay. So um, they make, you make about how many watches a year? Uh, we he doesn't make, make about, any. Yeah, we he make sells about, them. Collectively we make about 400. So I've got so about 1% got got about about of, of the annual production. I've got about 1% of annual production. Yeah, exactly right. Are you actually that good a salesman? Uh, well, I bunked, I, I bunked the numbers up a little bit. All right, okay, that's <laughs> so, so that's and obviously I sold to myself extremely that's, well. That's kind of my point. Yeah, yeah no, I have. I've done. I've done myself very well. So the first one um, is this one, um, which is a blue uh, Artem High Art, and the reason that I picked this was because when I was first uh, on holiday, I had a collection. Um, 
which had a number of pieces in it of which one very like this was one of them. It was the cheapest one in the collection at retailing at about 10,000. This one's more because it's got a different finish. Uh, and I thought, if I'm going on holiday to the States on a big adventure holiday with my yeah. wife and my little girl, and I want to keep posting on Instagram because I just learned Instagram at that point, so I need something to post. Mm -hmm. and, and I know if I ask Christine, she'll say, no, don't take any of them because you won't be insured. I went, well, what can I afford to pay for if it all goes wrong and I fall yeah. in a river? And uh, so that was the one I took. After three weeks of trotting around um, Vegas, we started out, we went riding in Montana for a week. Mm -hmm. We saw the eclipse in Jackson Hole. We went and did some hiking in Moab. We hiked all the way to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and we climbed all the way out again. That was hard work. Um, at the end of that three weeks, I had so fallen in love with that particular watch because we'd had a great holiday as well. It's um, not that at the end of the three weeks you wish you'd bought a G-Shock, no? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that at all. It's, uh, I, I had completely fallen in love with that watch. Yeah, and, I, and I worked out for myself that as a proud owner of a $1,500 Abel, if I chose to, I could own a proper watch. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, boom, it's like, why hadn't I thought of that before? But I, but I, I did, and then I had to have that one because um, by then it was a real good friend. Mm -hmm. uh, that's number three of 15. Um, 15 pieces only in the world ever. And you don't any own any of the other of the 15? Uh, I don't own any of the other 15, <laughs> just that one. one. One seemed like enough, but the reason it's number three is uh, three is never worse than par. Uh, and I'm a bit of a golfer and I decided that was going to be my lucky golfing watch. Right, okay. And the proof was in the pudding because the first time I wore it, which I know I shouldn't have been doing, everyone's told oh, me I shouldn't go. have been doing here that. Um, I was four under par with four to play, which okay. for me is pretty extraordinary. Uh, uh, the second I realised that, I took a triple bogey. I was going to say, the and, fact that you said it was yeah. four under with four to play. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 then, it then went south. That, yeah. So I, I, I went round in par, I dropped three at 15 and one at 16 and cursing myself and then <laughs> two so, pars to finish, so I was round in 70, which was good. What's that made of? That's steel. And, and you know, put those two beside each other and you go, oh yeah, oh, yeah I really can tell the difference now. <laughs> yep. It's, so it's, it's amazing. What is the, the little dimple? So the little dimple is the armband uhren precision handaufzugsmechanismus. Vorsprung Dirk technique? Yeah, kind okay. of that as well. So um, it is the way in which you set the time with these watches. So the hands, um, and I'll give you this one because it's probably the best example from my collection to show you. The hands are super fine, like mm -hmm. real filigree points and they point at a subdivided minute scale. Oh yeah. So that you can set the time absolutely exactly. It doesn't help you tell the time because there's a second hand as well. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is you can synchronize the minute hand absolutely precisely with the seconds. We've sweated bullets to make it the most accurate it can possibly be. And we thought, why not then put a mechanism in there which allows you to set the time without that jumpy thing that happens when you sometimes reset the time on other brands. So in order to set the time, you pull out the crown. Mm -hmm. You've got to boss it because it wants to pull back on you. Um, so give it a good tug. Fingernails Go probably a good thing. There, I don't have fingernails. Uh, fingernails. Okay. So you give it a good tug. It wants to pull back, and that's to stop um, moisture and dirt getting into the mechanism. So that mm -hmm. helps protect it. You then set the time absolutely exactly synchronized to the second. You restart it by pushing the little dimple. Yeah, uh, and that's disconnected from the movement that. Ah, so that, when you pull that, that, it hacks. It hacks, and then yep. that pops it back. Co correct, and that and that restarts it, so that there's no chance of the, um, the second hand jumping or the minute hand jumping. So, in English, it's called the pusher system. And <laughs> once upon a time, I said, "Well, it's I've had such great feedback on what a cool feature this is that it needs yeah. a better word than pusher system." So Sandra and I invented. Armband Uhren Precision Handaufzugs Mechanismus, which is all one word. And it means? It means push assistant. Okay. <laughs> it means it means precision it means precision wristwatch um, hand automatic hand thingy. setting mechanism thingy. This is what it means, but all in one word. Hashtag all the German sounding names. Yeah. Uh, so that's my second watch. Um, chosen for the hands, right? which are a different shape than those hands. Anything and, special about this dial? Uh, so that's an enamel dial, yeah, uh, so. and again, a steel watch, yeah. uh, which kind of happened by accident. So so it's, I wanted an enamel dial because I think enamel just looks so beautiful on a classic dress yeah. watch. Uh, and this enamel dial, which we'll come to, has the same shaped hands as my first watch, and I suddenly went, I need Banu hands. 
Right. And that was the Benu enamel. And it came with blue hands, which is not our house color. Oh. At which point I went, so I've got beautiful hands, but I haven't got anything in our house color. Right. And I went, I'm now properly hooked at this stage. So this is a Benu 37. You can see- With um, an odd ball size? Uh, sorry, say again? Bit of an odd ball size? Um, it is an odd ball size. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, um, so normally 41. Mm -hmm. Um, 37, we went, and, and the idea behind 37 was this is going to appeal to the Japanese market because um, they like a smaller piece. They're absolutely all over the detail and the astonishing finishing oh, yeah. and stuff like that. They love that to bits. So very, very good market for us. So that was made specifically for Japan. Smaller and, cock as well. And, and it is a smaller cock. Yeah. And uh, which, yeah, no, I'm not going to go there. Um, and um, what we discovered was it actually sells to men and to women all over the world. So although it was made specifically with Japanese men in mind, it's such a, it's, I've called this a, a, a small watch with a big personality mm -hmm. because there's, there's so much cool about the way in which as we were shrinking the, um, the case, yeah. we kind of expanded the numbers, put a twist in them, mm -hmm. um, the hands get shorter, but they're the same diameter, or they're the same width at the, at the widest point, yeah. at which point actually the whole thing starts to really come alive in front of you. And because the bezel, like most of our bezels actually, is so super fine, it's basically all dial. So mm -hmm. on your wrist, and you know, you're welcome to try it on, on your wrist it looks a whole lot bigger than a 37 millimeter watch. Yeah. So small watch, big personality. So I, I had, that one ambushed me a little bit because after getting two steel watches, I thought I need something with rose gold. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting I might get, you know, maybe a Bennu Power Reserve or something like that. And um, I'd seen the pictures of, the design pictures of this one before Basel in 20, get it right, 2018. And I went, okay, cool watch. Mm -hmm. But it didn't grab me. Then when I saw it in the metal, I went, oh my God, this is so much cooler than that I expected it to be. And on the wrist, I'm now going to put it on because I can't resist. Um, on the wrist, it's just yeah, fantastic. It's you know, beautiful. So, so that was watch number three, mm -hmm. at which point I went, I'm now feeling really upset with myself that I left the Artem enamel behind because I really like the Artem enamel um, because it's got a really cheeky blue 12. Never noticed that. Uh, yeah. And I was feeling very guilty about leaving it on the shelf. So that became my fourth watch. What's the story with the hands? Because they're not exactly blue. Um, they are not blue, good spot. So um, house colour was what I was going to talk about, which you've reminded me. Right. So ordinarily, and you know, for, for this audience, you guys know that you heat steel, it changes colour, it's called annealing, and there's a specific colour related to a specific temperature. Yeah. Um, blue is traditional mm -hmm. for watch hands. Blue's kind of easy to hit because there's a big wide band of temperature within which a watch hand is blue. This is brown violet. That's the color immediately before blue and um, comes after brown. Okay, so a few mm -hmm. colors, brown, brown, violet, blue. The temperature band for brown violet is only 10 degrees centigrade wide. And it's not one temperature, it's kind of a continuum of temperatures as it goes from brown to blue. Mm -hmm. So at the lower end, you get a brown violet, which is kind of browny. At the top end, you get a brown violet, which is kind of blue. Uh, the unbelievably difficult thing, heating one of these hand made hands by hand, is to get the whole hand the same temperature at the same time. So that from top to tail, it's the same color. That is really a hard job. And it is also the last part of the hand making process. You have to have it shaped and polished within an inch of its life before you start heating it where it won't heat evenly. Um, so in your two minutes worth of annealing, you can destroy your entire morning's work um, very easily if it goes wrong. They chuck about 10% of them away, even though they're That's absolute master, master really watchmakers. They're, they're very, very well practiced. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking at there is a brown violet hand. And I'm going to say that one is, let's see what end of the spectrum these two are. These are both kind of at the blue end okay. of the spectrum. So, so bluey brown violets. How close are they when you're looking? Um, these two are very close, actually. Yeah. Very close in colour. And it's kind of actually quite unusual. We can see some of the others. There'll be different colours. But uh, when you're making the hands, oh, they are. Um, you end up having to batch them. So even if it passes yep. quality control, because it's not mottled, it's the same colour from one end to the other, 
you have to batch them in, in light colors because yeah. you know one that was a little bluer than another which was a little browner would look so weird on a watch. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know they end up making little families of hands at the end of the day. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, Heard that obviously week, with the people that do the normal bluing. Yeah. Heard them do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And under these studio lights, you can really see we'll get some yeah. close up macro stuff to insert yeah. here. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. So I've got some others. Shall I show you some others? Yep. That's what we're here for. Um, and I'll start with uh, this one. Are you going to leave the big guy to the end? Uh, I think we should. Yeah, I think we should as well. This is going to be my fifth watch. Oh. Uh, this is a vintage look, Bennu Power Reserve. Uh, and I love that for three reasons. Uh, let's hope I remember three when I'm explaining them. One is the unbelievable fineness of those hands. Those, yeah. uh, I cannot say this with confidence because I haven't looked at every watch in the world, but I'm going to say with almost confidence they are the most extreme watch hands on the planet. Um, What's the th thickness? Uh, it's, uh, I believe, a twentieth of a millimetre. Looking for, yeah, someone who's giving me a nod. So thinner than a hair at their thinnest. How do you work with something like that? Uh, you get Carefully. someone who knows what they're doing to do it. I've had a go, uh, not not with one of those. I've had a go at one of the thick hands, and that didn't end well. So it's like how you how you work with something that thin. I just I I take my hat off to them. I think they're amazing. But it's so that extraordinary. Yeah. Um, the next reason that I love it is because it's got the antique logo. I was going to say yeah, uh, it's a kind of weird. And font. we first dug out the antique logo for Only Watch in 2017. Right. Uh, so the piece that we did for that, we gave with a pocket watch. So we did a, a an original Moritz Grossman pocket watch and its faithful um, wristwatch companion. <laughs> so so it was a, basically an yeah. image of it. Uh, and that antique look went over really well with the watch community. We'd only done one piece. So when it came around to only watch again, we were having kind of, at that, at that stage, I could say a streaky beard meeting because I still had a beard in those days, mm -hmm. um, where we were trying to decide what to do for only watch 2019. Uh, and I said, so why don't we do the antique look on a power reserve? Because power reserve is our best seller. The antique looks really going to blow you away when you see it on a power reserve. And Taylor said, yeah, yeah. I, like, I like that idea so much that we're not going to do it for any watch. We're going to do that for the, for the main range. So the second reason is that, or sorry, the third reason I'm going to say is uh, that that is my contribution to horology, or at least the germ of the idea. So that's going to be my fifth watch. Is there a special way that they're actually on the pin in the middle? Because it looks different from most other watches. Uh, I do not know the answer to that question. It almost looks like there's a, a diamond or a jewel on there, but um, I know there isn't. It, yeah. Uh, that, it so that's, that's just been black polished, I think. It is so sparkling that's, from the distance yeah. over here. I can see yeah. it's shining as if it's a diamond. Yeah. So is that a bit, yeah, it isn't a jewel. It's just that's just that's just, just amazingly that amazingly yeah. well polished piece of steel. Yeah, we'll get some close ups of that yeah. to drop in. Yeah. So that is that's going to be. Will it be my absolute favourite watch? I'm not sure. Those two are going to be scrapping for favouriteness. Okay. So uh, next one. Your house is on fire. Yeah. All your watches are in different rooms. Yeah. You can only get to one room. Which one do you go for? My lucky golfing watch. Because that way I can make enough gambling to to, uh, to rebuild the, the collection oh, and the house. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. So lucky golfing watch. Fair enough. Um, What's next? Yeah. So next one is um, it's kind of a follow-on from the one I've just shown you, and it also precedes it uh, because this is the Hamatic. If you look at the front side, you'll go, yeah, I've just seen something kind of like that. It's got. Um, same kind of hands, although mm -hmm. these ones are brown violet, they're not blue like that one, and uh, it's got a slightly different aesthetic. If you flip over the back, you'll go, my God, I've never seen Whoa. anything like that ever. Uh, because that is our first automatic movement, and straight away you're probably saying, where's the rotor? It's got an acorn in it. Yeah, it's got something that looks a oh. lot like an acorn. So, so is that like a bumper type? Um, it is, it's a, it's a pendulum mechanism, and the story behind this is, you know, for after we've been going for a couple of years, people were saying you should have an automatic movement. Why have you got an automatic yeah. movement? Why are they all self winding? Blah blah blah. And and the truthful answer would have been, well, we would make an automatic movement if we didn't think they were so unbelievably, unspeakably ugly because mm -hmm. of the big rotor that takes up all the real estate on the back. That, no, that's true. Yeah. That makes it 
you know, stops you seeing the movement, which and the beauty of the movement and the extreme finishing and stuff like that is the reason we're in business. So mm-hmm. why would we make a rotor? And then someone in the factory said, yeah, but what we could do is we could use a pendulum mass because that was the original automatic movement invented by Breguet, 1780. Mm-hmm. And that was the way in which all pocket watches in Moritz Grossman's day, if they were automatic, would have been powered. And they only disappeared in the 20s when someone invented the rotor, which was easier to chunk out in an industrial type setting. Yeah. So um, I think the last time, and I can't tell you which watch it was because I've forgotten, the last time a watch was made with this mechanism was I think the 60s. Right. So nowhere on the planet is anyone making a pendulum automatic movement today except for us. And for me, that's the most beautiful movement I've seen on a watch anywhere. And when did you guys bring this out? Uh, so the prototype was released in Basel in 2017, mm-hmm. 2018, 2018. Uh, and you know, a lot of work had gone into that prototype, yeah. turning it from prototype to actually production ready and ready for the rigors of being worn in day-to-day life. That was another huge um, engineering challenge, I'm going to call mm-hmm. it, because that's what it was. Uh, and uh, Jorn, who was you know, the guy who ran that, is, is, is so clever, he doesn't know how clever he is. Is one of these guys? Yeah, and you, uh, you, uh, I know the feeling. Yeah, so uh, absolutely a, astonishing piece of engineering, and they've managed to make it, of course, stunningly beautiful, yeah. which uh, is the reason that we're in business. How much of the production of the movements is based in the in house? In house. So, <laughs> so when you decide, so one of the first decisions that Christine made when she was going, how are we going to build the first watch, mm-hmm. was. We have to make hands that Grossman would have been proud of. And Grossman was world renowned as a hand maker. He also made, in addition to what to pocket watches, he made um, micrometer gauges, which have to have needle sharp hands, hence these needle sharp hands that you're mm-hmm. looking at here, so that you can read them super accurately. Yeah. Um, and if you're going to make hands like that, you kind of have to hand make them. If it takes one person a day to make three hands, and they might not be a set, and you've only got two people making hands, that tells you what your production is going to be like annually, yeah. more or less. At which point you go, do we want to be relying on anybody else for any of the metal parts of our mechanism? Because we'll be a tiny part of their customer base and we'll be at the end of their supply chain. Yeah. Well, actually, you haven't got that choice. So all of the metal stuff, which you see on the back of that, is made in-house. With The accept- the only metal piece which is not made in-house is the spring, um, which mm-hmm. is you know super specialist equipment and then you know glass isn't made in house mm-hmm. um, you know the jewels stuff like that but all of the um, metallic parts of the movement made hand, um, precision cut with machinery to start with and then all absolutely immaculately hand finished mostly with tools that the ha- that the that the watchmakers themselves have made by hand because you can't get the tool to do the hand finishing yeah. so where did them. you guys find these <clears throat> master technicians craftsmen if you've only been going for just over a decade. So Glasseter is, uh, so, you know, legacy of Moritz Grossman's you stole school of watchmaking is that, is that, is that um, that skill has existed in the town ever since his day. Wow. Even, you know, the behind the Iron Curtain days, all, all the little mm-hmm. ateliers were, were gathered together in one big, um, you know, East German business, the mm-hmm. GUB, the, the, and I'm not going to try and say it in German because I'll mess it up. Uh, and when the wall came down, uh, the GUB survived, I think, only for months. Um, and as that collapsed, all the little ateliers sprang up again with Langer, who were, yeah. who were you know, the biggest um, guys in town, probably, in mm-hmm. terms of uh, brand profile, arguably. And Nomos and Glasseter Riganar might argue with that. But, uh, you know, all of those businesses sprung up again. And there are now, I think there are nine watch businesses in town. Um, and it's, a you know... It's a tiny little town stuck away in Good. the hills in Saxony. It's beautiful. May have to head over then and have a look myself. You should. You mm. definitely should. When you get yeah. there, come to the factory. I'll show you just a couple more Perfect. of these. So just very quickly, I'll show you this one. The reason I'll show you that one is because it's kind of hard to find a rectangular watch uh, these days. That People do make them, but they're, with most people out of fashion, we have specially designed a That's rectangular a movement, movement to go in it. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a... 
it's not a circular movement no. that's been shoehorned into a rectangular case. It's a, it's a specially redesigned movement that looks absolutely gorgeous. Quite that heavy. Uh, quite, but lighter than it should be because it's actually that's that's steel which is plated because it's it's the it's the traveling collection. Right. The 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 real version would be much heavier in your hand than that. Mm -hmm. What's the real one? Is that platinum? It, it's, uh, so it's white gold. Right. Uh, so there's that one. Then there's a cool story behind each of the three of these, and I'll start with this one. I think. How much is this one? Uh, that one is top of my head, low thirties. I really like that one. And this is not the kind of style that I would normally yeah. go for. And again, you're welcome to try it on. It really cool t-shirt. But it's me. black. It does. It's black. Really, that is a good uh, point. So, and, and because, you know, we're happy to custom make things, we could make that black with, we could do the numerals in that mm -hmm. colour. I'm sure we could do it. So you oh, could do the four and six. We could do the four and the six yep. maybe just in that colour and all the rest in white. You'd have to put a six on it. We'd have to put a six on it. Yeah. We could put a six where the seven is. Oh. <laughs> Would have been and you just have to, yeah. GMT plus one? Yeah, yeah, yeah good. exactly, yeah. Good. No space for a six where the six should be because yeah. that's where the, uh, the sub-second style lives. Um, so this one, uh, oh. have, a, have a look at that whilst I'm, uh, in fact, oh. in fact, tell me about that. You tell me about that. Uh, Mother of Pearl. Yeah. With a moon. Yeah. Don't know if it's a moon phase, doubt it. It's not a moon phase, no. It's, it's got a, a tilted bevelled dial. Yeah, asymmetric tilted bevelled dial. With slightly changing coloured stones of different sizes and a really interesting pattern. Have I missed anything? Uh, lugs. Oh, yeah, I missed that completely. Mm -hmm. um, half price sale. <laughs> <laughs> so lugs that only wow. collect on one side. Yeah. And uh, and what's the position of the sub seconds dial? Mm, seven ish. It's down at seven o'clock. So mm -hmm. so completely asymmetric, in lots of different ways, but kind of looks balanced. Is this using the golden ratio or anything? Uh, ooh, do you looks know a what? Bit like it's a it's a great question, and I should know the answer. I don't. It may well be, and the reason I say it may well be is because it was designed by someone cleverer than me. Mm. Uh, so the inspiration for that came to a guy called Michael Coe during a watch dinner, uh, I think in about 2017, 2016, something right. like that. Um, Michael is a uh, Singaporean uh, sculptor, really, whose thing is, is finding ways of setting off precious jewels and stuff like that, so they really look amazing. He saw a very, very plain version of that watch with the um, sub-seconds dial down at seven o'clock, uh, and all the rest of it just completely plain, mm -hmm. which was a range piece at that time. The vision of this watch flew into his head whilst he was looking at it. He left without speaking, went straight to his design table and designed that overnight, came back the next morning and said, do you guys want to collaborate on making this watch? And we said, hell yeah, it's fantastic. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, and we called it the Sleeping Beauty mm -hmm. in honor of his long evening at the design table. So how many collaborations do you guys do? Or is it something very rare? Uh, so we've done it more than once. We, we've, um, I can't show you any pieces here, but a couple of times we've done really successful um, limited edition ranges for Siddiqui. All oh, right. Uh, there was one called the Extreme Dubai, and the story behind that was um, Siddiqui says to us, uh, you know, there's a market here in the Emirates for um, distressed looking watches. Could you do me a distressed looking watch that looks like it's been buried in a sand dune for... <laughs> A while, and Teo said, "Well, if we're going to do that, we're going to make it really distressed. If that's okay, so yeah. well, and it sounds like an 18 certificate kind of a thing because it's like it's going to be really extreme. So we'll do a limitation of 18 pieces, but the last one we'll cut in two, and you'll you can have one half, and we'll have the other half, and so it's 17 and a half piece limitation, and we'll give you 17 to sell. Uh, there's a few pictures of those knocking around um, right. that you can see. All 17 of those sold before it was launched." Uh, and then we did another really mad thing with sand inside the case, but another case inside so they didn't get in the mechanism. And oh, cool. that was called the Sands of Time. Um, again, for him, that sold out. And we've done uh, other limitations, none of which I can bring to mind for specific people. Mm -hmm. And we regularly do one-off pieces for someone who says, well, I kind of like that, but could we do it just with a few twists? Yeah. So, Good. Yeah. What's next? Uh, next one is this one. Uh, another great story behind this one. And here, my um, 
the chairman, uh, my skiing buddy, Theo Stauf, uh, went to a dinner party one evening. And uh, one of the ladies at the dinner party says, these mechanical watches, Theo, are all very well, but it's mm -hmm. like I could never own one because if I were to wind it, then I'd mess up my manicure. So Theo spotted an opportunity, went back to the factory and said, who can think of an idea of how to wind one of these mechanical watches without messing up your manicure? And the answer is you wind it with the strap like that. Um, that was shortlisted for GPHG, not this one just gone, but the one before that. Uh, so for a tiny little 50 person business buried in the Saxon Hills to mm -hmm. be listed for the watch Oscars we thought was pretty cool. It is quite a cool mechanism. Does it exist anywhere else? Uh, to my so knowledge, well? no. I, okay. it's, I, I don't think we've patented it, which to me seems a bit dark. Ricky, Ricky, Rick, 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 yeah. uh, yeah. laptop out. Now. Yeah, but uh, it's, you know, a very simple idea, but for, again, going from idea and prototype through to this is now robust enough to go out in the market and not come back. But when you say simple idea, you know, it's like the best ideas are simple. It's the first person that yeah. gets there. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And I can't believe that no one has thought of doing this before. Yeah, because it, uh, it's a beautiful piece. And there's there's mm -hmm. a my my own uh, there's a few different versions of that same watch. My own uh, favourite is a thing called the Fancy, which again is completely asymmetric and and sort of you know some sparkle involved and yeah. a bit of mother of pearl and stuff instead of the Guilloche dial there. So I, I prefer that one, but it's kind of. It's an interesting uh, ratcheting arrangement in the back as well. It is, and it's uh, on the ratchet wheel, there's only 11 teeth. And the reason for that is you don't want to be winding it when you're just moving. So it wants to be quite a big movement before it actually puts some power in there. Right. Uh, but it's also geared so that you cannot possibly overwind it. And that was Good. Uh, that was Good. that was a lot of the, the engineering difficulty. But uh, and I'm I'll see you in Rick is going Let's to test that theory. Get the drill out. Yeah, yeah. So, it's not yeah. it's not as robust as a G-Shock, so don't don't drop it out the window yeah. for goodness sake. And I was hearing earlier on that the way that this is geared, you only need to twist it what six times to get it Correct. fully round. Yeah, That's yeah, six mean. twists and you're there. Fantastic. There you go. So that's that one, and then the last one. Well, we're I all out of time, in. guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's have a look at this guy. So the last one is uh, kind of the hero piece. Yeah. In this particular, so this is the tourbillon, uh, which is bigger, so you can probably see it better from over there. Uh, yeah. Forty-four and a half millimeters, and fair heft to it. Although Oof. it's only white gold, if that was made out of platinum, you wouldn't yeah. be able to raise your wrist because it's got it. It's quite a big chunk of metal. I've got uh, very strong wrists, I'll have you know. <laughs> so then we will try on a platinum one. Yes, we shall. We'll just we'll we'll talk about the price later. Um, that particular one is a limitation of ten, uh, of which there are only two left. I think it's numbers four, or, number four and number six, are still available for someone who wants a beautiful um, black tourbillon with polished steel hands. What kind of tourbillon is this? Um, so it is. It's a flying tourbillon. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, I think the most unusual feature of that is it, have a look at the little V-shaped bridge that's turning. Yeah. And tell me how fast that's rotating Very versus slow. your expectation. Yeah, yeah. So that's a three-minute tourbillon. So it's, right. so it's so it's a three three minutes before it does its full circuit. Mm -hmm. um, there are three features I'd point you to on this one. One of which I'm going to fiddle with a little bit to show you. Right, um, because as with most of our pieces, it's got an oversized balance wheel. Mm -hmm. Although it's already a 44 and a half millimeter case, in order for the entire balance and tourbillon aperture to be visible through the front, it takes a lot of the dial. So yeah. it goes all the way to the middle and it goes all the way to the edge of the case, as a result of which you lose the numbers between 25 and 35. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to make the case any bigger. So the answer to that is, so that you can read the time between 25 and 35, you put a long tail on the minute hand, and you put a little subscale in the middle of the watch, and you read the time there instead. I believe you mentioned that in the podcast, but yep. it was hard to visualize what you meant. Yep, so it's, yeah. uh, I did indeed mention it in the podcast. So that is um, a little piece of um, patented this time German, <laughs> ingen is it? German oh. ingenuity. So, uh, so it's no it's, shame. It's, it's, it is a very cool watch. It's near good to you. Um, Give us the lowdown for those who don't know that may or may not include me as the 
merits or otherwise of a flying tour wheel versus a non flying tour? What's the, I mean, is a non is the opposite of a flying tour wheel a non flying tour wheel? Uh, you'd have to ask someone who knew what they were talking about oh, for the answer okay, to well, that one. You're, you're, now, you're now at the well, edges of my, ask, of my we'll horological knowledge. Uh, Grounded tourbillons. <laughs> yeah, but I, I will tell you that a tourbillon in a wristwatch, honestly, is of absolutely zero practical value other than to prove that you're a committed watch hand with a ton of money. Yes. Um, because the, the original idea of a tourbillon is to eliminate the effect of gravity mm -hmm, um, yeah. on, a, on a wall hanging um, marine chronometer, lest you run into a reef somewhere off Ecuador. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so the whole idea of a tourbillon on a watch is a bit weird, but um, very beautiful. How much? Uh, that one, round number's 150. Whoa. Okay. Yep. Uh, two we, other cool. Did we, did we lace the drinks, Ricky? See, <laughs> for 150 quid, I'd buy it. Are they all, are they all due to fall asleep any second? Try, it, try, it, try it on. I will later. Yeah, it is, I've tried that one on. Yeah. It is yeah. absolutely epic. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's a it scratch kind of, on the side. Yeah, it was there. It wasn't me. Oh dear, okay. There you go. It's 110 um, now. It's, uh, it's 90. The, the thing about the collection is it, it's it's there for handling and for travelling. Yeah. So it's kind of, we like to see a scratch. Well, we're happy to have both handle and travel with it, if you yeah. like. <laughs> Now, the reason we found out about you was yep. through one of your traveling watches. Yep. We met up with Dave Sharp, who runs the Red Bar events here in the UK, predominantly yep. in Scotland. Yep. And he gave Rick a loan of one of your watches, yep. which was a foolish move. But hey, you're here today, so maybe it did work out in everybody's yep. favor. Yeah, so okay, yeah, I'm going to Perth. I think that was where the wheels fell off. Yeah. <laughs> so, Should I, I kept going to Dundee. You know, and that's... That's actually been a pleasure. So the first time I was up here in Glasgow was, I don't know, 15, 16 months ago when I first, mm -hmm. I first met Dave there. And we cooked up the idea of putting some Moritz Grossman watches into circulation in yep. the Red Bar following, following that meeting because it seemed a great way of having really genuine, full-on watch enthusiasts yep. get to know a piece that otherwise they might only ever read about or see pictures of or whatever it is because it's, you know, with 400 pieces in a year, it's not like we've got a big retail no. um, footprint for people to see them. And it, it's, uh, it's been a very valuable way of getting the word out. I definitely feel it's time for a tour beyond to go on tour. <laughs> yeah. Maybe two. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a couple of brands could Maybe do that. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm, not sh I'm not sure the insurance would work for that. It's kind of we. I, we... I don't mind insuring it. <laughs> don't mind insure. If you just want me to pay the cost of insurance, and give us the watch, that's absolutely fine. Oh, it is. Everything about it is lovely. Yeah, so whilst you're handling it, it's um, there's Losing two, value. There's two <laughs> bits of organic matter. I'm in, busy scraping off yeah. the gold. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's two, but before, before we get any of Ricky on the back of it, after he's worn it, there's, yeah. there's already two bits of organic matter in that watch. Um, one of which is a piece of wood. Uh, the name of the wood is guayacum or lignus feti. Uh, and you would have seen that used in uh, chronometer movements a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, and cool thing about this wood is it's very hard. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to shape and it's also very stable. So it doesn't sort of move about with temperature and, and uh, yeah. humidity and stuff like that. What's it used for uh, in here? Crucially, it's self-lubricating. So what it's used for in there is it's um, is a brake on the wheel that um, drives the second hand. So the second hand moves just with an absolutely perfect sweep like oh. this. Uh, and were we to use normal materials, then what you'd need to do is you'd need to get at that capstan about once every four or five years and lubricate it. With the self-lubricating wood in there, it will need servicing in about 400 years is our guess. Uh, so that's cool. I'm not going to make that. Regretfully. Yeah. Yeah. Managed to nearly 400 years. Dave's pool will have paid out by yeah. the time that needs lubricated. Right, yeah. and what else is in uh, there? And so the other bit that's in there is a piece of, uh, so there's a brush. And we talked about this in the podcast as well, but I can now, I'm if you, if you look in like whether... I don't know what's yeah. going on here. So if you, if you, if you look in, I know you are. Um, if you look in where the 25 is, you might be able to see the brush because you know where to look now. Um... Take where's the loop? Here we go. That's that's a loop. Grab that in one. Germany. And uh, is this your trick? <laughs> My <laughs> and have a, and have a look. So um, the brush stops the balance and the tourbillon cage in order that the second hand stops. As and so we can set the time. You set it exact to the second. Mm -hmm. uh, and the big idea was to use a brush. And the guys in the prototyping department 
tried um, the first type of hair. Uh, let's pretend for a second it was horse hair. Mm-hmm. And if horse hair is too rigid, then this one was too rigid. And then they went, oh, too rigid. Let's try something more flexible like badger. Mm, too wiggly. And so you just kept killing animals. Uh, we kept, we, we did. It's, luckily, there's quite a dangerous road running up the hill from <laughs> from Glasshutter. So between there and the Czech border, there's, there's also there's, uh, there's, yeah, enough road kill that you can get all the hair you want. Um, uh, they'd been through everything, basically, is the, is the tail end of the story. And they, they had a difficult meeting with Christine where they said, oh, Christine, we're terribly sorry, but it's a big idea as a brush, but it's a hair. We cannot make it work. It's as a tool, rigid or too flexible. It's, yeah, we have to abandon. Mm-hmm. And she says, oh, for goodness sake, she says, I'm going to the hairdressers myself tomorrow. I bring you some of my hair. You can try that. Mm-hmm. Two weeks later, the back of the office, Christine, it works. So, so what they discovered entirely by accident was it has and to be human that's hair. that's the bit of the show we're going to clip and send to all of Robin's colleagues <laughs> in the office. <laughs> Casualracism.com. <laughs> Excellent. And, and the good news is it doesn't have to be Christine's hair. If it freaks you out a little bit, you can get one. Well, can you choose? You, you, you could, yeah, you'd need to let yours grow a little bit longer and then you could mm-hmm. and then you could take a sample. So, you know, if you've got, like I said, round numbers, 150, um, and you really wanted one of these and you wanted either number four or number six in the black, then if you wanted your son's hair or your daughter's hair or your wife's hair or any other human's hair in it, um, I'll, we, I'll would, we would we would we pay for the haircut. <laughs> we'd pay for the haircut, uh, and we'd um, hand deliver your own personalised tourbillon to you uh, with the greatest of glee. But it couldn't be your hamster or your cat or your dog or your wolves. It's okay. just a little bit too serial killer for me, you know, having, <laughs> having somebody's hair in a watch. Yeah, but CSI, no, that's that's pretty cool. Well, listen, thanks very much for bringing these wonderful pieces along and getting the chance to see them instead of just hearing about them or even seeing the photos online it really doesn't do justice and and what's next when is the steel sports watch with integrated blades bracelet and And blue blue face coming out I could tell you but I'd have to kill you it's always the case isn't it fantastic if people want to have a look at more of these things where can they go to find out Uh, so they can go they can go online um, to uh Grossmanuren.com with a hyphen in it. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, or Google, Google Moritz Grossman. Um, if you want to see them in person in the UK, the, uh, the two places they're stocked in the UK at the moment, one is William and Son uh, in the heart of Mayfair, and the other is uh, David Carpenter. Um, oh, good. Has got a little yep. collection in Tunbridge Wells uh, alongside his fantastic watch repair business, watchmaking business. He's mm-hmm. selling some. And the, David's idea was... People keep asking me when they bring me watches a hatful at a time and they go, these five I'm never going to wear. Can you sell them for me? What shall I spend my money on? Yeah. And David says, well, you know, on the basis of, you know, the chef's having this, if you want the finest movement that money can buy, then this would be it. Uh, so that's the premise on which uh, he's um, taken them in Tunbridge Box. Fantastic. What can we expect to see this year? Uh, so, OK, so one of the things you can expect to see this year is um, more watches? Yeah, well, no. Oh, watches. Well, 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 no, 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 I'm trying. I'm trying to leave silence I'm, here I'm to, because he's thinking of spilling the beans. I'm trying to. I'm trying to decide how to how to describe it. It's. Um, I want people to get more access to more of what I know mm-hmm. about Moritz Grossman and and how I know it and why I feel strongly enough to own five of the damn things. Yeah. Um, so I'm building a little, um, a little microsite. I'm going to be advertising with you guys so that yep. people can find their way to it. And through that, discover some more guff from behind the scenes about why it is that, uh, you know, I would feel strongly enough about these to, to care about them. And I, I, again, I can't remember whether we said this on the podcast or not, but uh, I used to work in aerospace and I would travel to precision engineering factories worldwide yeah. Uh, and go, oh, yes, you're all doing very well, keep it up, and stuff like that. I'd never been to a factory anything like you see when you visit here in Glasgow. Yeah. And the first time I went to that factory, I almost burst into tears. So so you'll be able to see more of my story mm-hmm. on a little website that you guys are going to help me yep. um, put out Sounds there. Sounds good to me. Perfect. Well, that was great. Thank you very much for coming along. And, Absolute uh, pleasure. Great to see you. This has actually turned out better than I thought. When I gave you the idea of hopping a plane, you were like, show me them. We'll get the cameras out. I didn't expect them to look quite as 
interesting, all of them, as they have done. So that's great. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you guys for tuning in to another episode of the talk show. We should be hopefully doing this on a more regular basis because you seem to like it. As always, leave us some comments, your thoughts, feedback, like, subscribe, tell your friends, and be sure to check out our podcast. It comes out twice a week, Mondays and Fridays. You can get it anywhere podcasts are. And obviously our website, scotchwatches.co.uk and our Instagram, at scotchwatches. Mm -hmm.